You will now see magic. Do not trust your intuition. This camera looks at this sphere. In the image, you can see one side, one half of the sphere. But using the dark arts of mathematics, we get a 360 degree Google Street View style live panoramic video. Everything just from this image, just from this piece of information. Using this PlayStation 5 controller, I control merely a virtual camera. The real one, it remains still. This mathematical magic has a name. The mirrorball projection. Right now, you and me, video and web app in hand, we'll go on a multimedia adventure. From movie making history, into paintings, the inside of a human mouth, industry machinery, places where no camera can even survive, like the inside of a running microwave, and of course, the map behind it. At the end of our journey, I'll need your help to create the largest image collection of mirror balls. Before we get started, this video is also available on Deutsch, Nihongo Mo, and Naruskim. You are now seeing This is my submission to the Summer of Math Exposition 2023. And off we go. Here is how it will work. I made a web app which you can access in parallel to this video in a separate browser tab or via your smartphone. In the web app, you can view important examples and scenes ugh, as either the original image and its projection, its environmental projection, and you can interact with it. If you need a quick summary instead of half an hour of entertainment, everything summarized in a paper I presented at the conference ICPE 2022. Don't worry, this video isn't all dry and boring theory. Every other chapter will go into the crazy exploits that researchers have come up with over the years. But first, the basics. Standing next to the camera, as I wave my hand, you can see the reflection of me in the middle area of the sphere. As I go to the left side of the sphere, you can still see me in the reflection, but more distorted, elongated. As I go around the back, I am smeared along the whole outer edge of the sphere. And finally, crossing the back of the sphere, I emerge on the other side. Here I coded a function which projects a bunch of colorful dots from the edge of the screen onto the sphere, so you can see how the image coordinates get mapped. Just take a moment to appreciate the beauty of how the colors dance by the rules of the projection and how the distance between the points change, expressing the amount of distortion happening. This sphere reflects its surroundings, which the camera captures as an image a projection of the sphere's environment onto the 2D plane of the image. So each point on the ball in the 2D image encodes a 3D vector. This projection goes by a bunch of different names, depending on the context and the field in question, mainly mirrorball projection, mirrorball mapping and sphere mapping. It's a special case from two disciplines. One is map projection from the field of cartography, as a lot of the lessons learned from that field apply to our mirror sphere. In fact, we may convert any map projection to our mirrorball format and look around the kind of inverted earth. And the other one is curved mirrors, as the mirrorball can be classified as a convex spherical mirror. These are the keywords you can pull from if you want to learn more on your own. Take note how the front 90 degrees of the reflection take up most of our image and how the back 90 degrees only get a thin slice. How the surface of the sphere maps information per angle changes by the sine of that angle divided by 4. What may go against intuition is how an image of half the sphere gives the full 360 degree environment. You can see what's behind the sphere at the edges. 
This includes what's 180 degrees behind the sphere, because the tangent of the camera's view ray, so to speak, touching the edge of the sphere are still technically a reflection, though this point is infinitely small and thus not resolved in a finite resolution image. Of course, you probably already noticed the elephant in the room. The sphere has a physical size blocking parts of what we can see. Our model, though, assumes that the sphere used to capture the environment is infinitely small, a point. That is, of course, impossible. And this disagreement leads to distortion. The model doesn't line up with reality. The smaller the ball, the less of this type of distortion we get. Note how we teleport into the viewpoint of the sphere, at least mathematically, no matter where the camera is, where we capture from, we capture the same information, just rotate it differently. The other thing that our model assumes is that the camera is orthographic, meaning all of its view rays are parallel, so to speak. Our eyes work via the perspective projection. Things get smaller the further away they move. With an orthographic camera, that is not the case. Useful if you are 3D modeling or doing CAD design to compare sizes independent of distance. There are lenses that can give you that, called telecentric lenses, used especially in industry to monitor production lines. There are even lenses that work the other way around, where things get bigger the further away they move, which allows you to even look behind objects. Incredibly counterintuitive, yet fascinating at the same time. If you're interested in that, check out this coverage from YouTube channel Applied Science about that. But I really struggle to metaphorically reel in the script and not derail the video. And yeah, I bought a whole rope just for this stupid gag. The point is, almost every single camera on Earth uses the perspective projection. Not another graphic one is presumed by the mathematical model. A very long focal length approximates an orthographic camera, but even with a long zoom, the edges of the sphere are never truly captured. This leads to distortion at the pole point of the projection. The two important properties of the projection to mention are one pole point, no seams. To understand these properties, let's look at another projection. For full 360 degree images and video, the simplest one is equirectangular. Here we have two pole points and one seam. In the context of environment projections, a pole point is a certain point, one specific view direction, which maps to multiple points in the projection image. For instance, here the geographic North Pole maps to the whole upper edge of the image. So does the South Pole to the lower edge. You may say those pole points are represented by an infinitely thin line along the top and bottom edges. A seam is a cut of sorts, a continuous line which is projected more than once onto our image. Here the left and right side of our image represent the same set of points. We can glue the seam together, so to speak. Our mirrorable projection is seamless and has one single pole point represented as a unit circle around the edge of the mirror ball in our projection model. Intuitively, this means that to unwrap this image, this circle has to be stretched somehow over an imaginary ball to connect all points on the circle back together into a single one. Different projections have different numbers of seams and pole points, creating different trade-offs. Skyboxes in older video games and YouTube's 360 degree video format uses cube mapping, a projection with no pole point but a bunch of seams, a very low distortion approach. And Facebook, Meta, have developed their own projection based on a pyramid for less distortion in the main viewing direction and more video compression everywhere else. Different goals, different approaches, but fundamentally, completely ignoring the finite resolutions of our image, they all represent the same information, just encoded differently, and they can be converted between each other. Another shortcoming of our mirrorable projection is that the image square is not used to its full potential. So why use this despite all of its shortcomings? Well, 
it's a 360 degree projection you can capture in the real world. No stitching of multiple photos or anything of the sort required. We already talked about how this projection does not give us information per view angle equally. A possible drawback. But what if I told you, for certain applications, this is not a bug, it's a feature. Mirror balls and spherical mirrors more broadly are a well understood part of maths and their use in capturing panoramas is nothing new. However, this technique had a monumental rebirth in the field of computer graphics. And there is no other photo that is more important to this rebirth than this Christmas ornament photographed by Jean Miller in 1982. This ectochrome photo slide was used to create the reflections on this blobby dog. If you know the normal of the surface on your 3D model, you can directly map it to a point on the mirror ball to get environmental reflections. Essentially, a normal is the vector that starts at the surface and points away from said surface at a right angle. And the beauty here is that the mirror ball directly encodes this information, because the normal vector of a unit sphere is per definition represented by its surface. Reflection mapping was born. And throughout the years it showed up in different parts of computer graphics. Not always related to mirror spheres, mind you, but it was how it started. Captain Disillusion also made a video about this part of movie history and about what's real and what's computer generated in the flight of the navigator. Super interesting, really check it out. Remember the part about the back portion having the worst resolution? Well, that's perfect to represent what should be reflected on your 3D model. The part of the environment that is reflected the clearest is the reflection towards the camera. And the low resolution part of the mirror ball, well, that's squished along the edges of the 3D model, just like the sphere. A match made in heaven. And from there, a new technique emerged in computer graphics. This technique was my first contact with this field of mathematics, and I fell in love with it. So the mirror ball pose is, is, is a Statue of Liberty pose. Basically, you got to get down on one knee and thrust it upwards like that. And you want to tilt your hand forward and get it forward so you're, not, so you're getting not very much of yourself in it. In high school, I wanted to become a filmmaker. Here is a VFX shot from a movie I did. To make the tank look realistic, we have to light it realistically. But instead of building the surrounding light information by hand, one photo of this mirror sphere is all it takes. And it doesn't have to be a good photo either. The bright sky from the top and the colors of the surroundings all come together to ground this 3D model in the shot. And since the camera used to capture this scene, and to capture the mirror ball is the same, it's perfectly color matched. This is called image-based lighting. And whilst this technique doesn't require a mirror ball specifically, the history of both techniques are inseparable. To this day, one of the most convenient ways to match lighting of your scene and a staple of even big budget Hollywood productions. Maybe not always as the primary source of lighting information, but as a reference or as a backup, you can still find them around. If you're interested in the computer graphics angle here, check out the webpage of researcher Paul Debevec, who has the most comprehensive write-ups about the history of reflection mapping and image-based lighting. He is best known for his work on light stage, a clever technique to capture 3D scans of humans, which is the basis of many Hollywood productions to this day. Also the webpage of Paul Borg who has many important contributions in the field, as well as the, the best infographics about this field in the whole World Wide Web. If your first name is Paul, you are clearly predisposed for greatness within this field. And finally, for a look into the workflow around capturing and working with image-based lighting at a modern video game studio, check out this GDC talk by Artyom Krzyzanowski. But I digress. Math time. I'll show you how I derived the mirror ball projection formula for use within my web app. There is more than one way to skin the cat. Here is mine. The web app will take a photo, video, capture card feed or webcam stream of a mirror sphere and project it so that we may take a look around. This will be happening directly on the graphics processor via a shader written in GLSL. 
This shader will take the view direction for each pixel of the screen and map it to the corresponding pixel in the mirror ball image. Essentially what we'll need is a function that takes a 3D vector as the input and outputs the corresponding pixel's coordinate on the 2D plane of the image. 3D vector in, 2D vector out. To get our projection formula, let's first collect a bunch of stuff. The cornerstone of all of this, the law of reflection. You may recall this formula from when learning about the incident ray angle being equal to the reflection ray angle in your high school physics class. Same thing. We have our view direction vector or the reflected ray vector and we want to know the incident ray vector and how it maps to our image. Next up, we define our camera with a simple orthographic definition. Mathematically, it means that all our camera's view rays, for lack of a better term, are parallel and can be expressed by the vector 0, 0, 1. Our image is also loaded within the same coordinate system and dimensions as our screen. We assume that the image is cropped to the edges of the mirror ball so that the mirror ball is a unit disk when looking at the image. To populate our law of reflection, we need to know the normal vector n. As mentioned before, the definition of the sphere provides us with a great shortcut, because the normal of the sphere is automatically provided by the vector from the origin to the sphere's surface. So, this point on our sphere already expresses the normal vector at that point. Another insight is that we are using an orthographic camera when projecting to the screen. So all the coordinates on the XY plane of both image and unit sphere are identical. This is why we usually set up things with these mathematically perfect orthographic cameras and express ourselves with unit circles, unit spheres, screen coordinates going from minus one to one, because a lot of stuff becomes vastly easier. So the XY plane is well defined, but the unknown becomes the depth component of our normal vector. Returning to the law of reflection, we may now populate it. This equation can be further simplified, which lands us here. This can be rewritten as a system of equations. This allows us to solve the third equation for our unknown depth component of the normal vector. That way we rephrase the normal in terms of our input view direction. Our first two equations are still the wrong way around though. We want the image coordinates as the output and the reflection vector as the input. Now we may insert the depth component of our missing normal. Simplifying the equation, we finally arrive at our projection formula. Turn this into code and our shader now maps the view direction per pixel to the corresponding pixel in the image, which allows us to look around our environment. There is a beauty to having it all expressed as one projection formula in one shader. Without diving into the code specifics and GPU rendering in general, as long as the image data we want gets uploaded to the graphics card, the input resolution does not matter. Even this old laptop with the GMA Graphics Media Accelerator 4500, an onboard graphics chip released in 2008, so slow as to receive the nickname Graphics Media Decelerator, has no issues performing this projection at 60 frames a second on a full HD screen with a 100 megapixel photo or this 4K video stream. All this involves no 3D geometry and there is no sphere that we slap the texture on, so we don't have some of the issues simple panorama viewers have, like some weird rippling or bending due to the 3D sphere having finite resolution. If you are interested in this specific 3D rendering approach, I recommend the presentation Rendering Worlds with Two Triangles by Inigo Quires, who is the co-creator of Shader Toy, by the way, and his whole blog in general for fascinating innovations around 3D rendering. Oh, that part about the pull point of the projection, exactly the opposite of the camera, looks horrible, all distorted and stuff. Addressing the distortion at the pull point was the topic of my 2019 bachelor thesis. Specifically, this distortion at the pull point happens because the camera used to capture our mirror sphere is a perspective camera. Because it doesn't see the edges of the sphere, it fails to capture the true pull point of the mirror ball projection. So we would have to change our model from an orthographic camera to a perspective one. However, Instead of rederiving the projection formula with a perspective camera, I chose a different approach. 
Here is my logic. We don't see the true pole point because it's beyond the horizon, so to speak. So to fix our model, we have to push those vectors, scale them by some amount in the image plane. That way we can invalidate those few directions that become bigger than our unit circle and more closely match our model to what our perspective camera actually captured. Or more intuitively, we shrink the image so it matches more closely with what the perspective camera actually captured. We have to scale those vectors by some amount, specifically by the ratio of how much the sphere is reflecting our environment, a new kind of field of view named alpha. The same ratio that governs how many pixels per angle are reflected on our surface. Let's think of what alpha should represent. It must be smaller than 360 degrees, since that is our perfect case with the orthographic camera, but it also shouldn't be smaller than 180 degrees, as that would constitute a camera being pushed up infinitely close to the mirror sphere and our model stops making sense. With that scaler in place, we can now stretch this pole point and counteract the distortion. More importantly though, we have a rigid definition for this lack of information, which means we can do something about it. In my bachelor's I wrote a crude shader, actually found it <laughs> first try, that filled in the missing information based on sampling the colors around the pole point. A quick sanity check is that if we use an orthographic camera again and the field of view alpha becomes 360 degrees, then this scalar becomes 1, meaning that the scalar leaves the vectors untouched and our formula returns to its original form. Our model dictates that the sphere is a unit circle in our image plane, so we have to crop the image. Find the correct field of view and voila! No more distortion at the pole point. But how do we get this field of view? Practically just play around with the slider and eyeball it until there is the least amount of distortion. As we row closer to the camera, the blind spot grows, so the field of view of the sphere shrinks. Or if the diameter of the sphere shrinks, the blind spot does too, so our field of view increases. That was the meat and potato parts of the video. As for the dessert, from here on out, it's memes and demo time. Please remain seated and keep your limbs inside the train at all times. Do not attempt to open the doors until the train has come to a complete halt at the station platform. So, you can teleport into anything that resembles a mirror sphere or a section of one. If you start looking around, that applies to a surprisingly large number of objects. For instance, these streetlights are silvered on the back side, making up half a sphere. And boom! 360 degree panorama! This fire hydrant! 360 degree panorama! This giant sphere I found in Tokyo! and any of those half-sphere mirrors protecting against theft. And oh boy, do I have a big collection of those. They can also be smaller segments of mirror balls coming back to convex mirrors in general, like this quarter mirror in a post office in Germany. Put a camera in the office over there, well, now you got a wide-angle camera in the room without having a wide-angle camera in the room. And a soup ladle, because of course, I know this is a spoon, I bought a soup ladle specifically for this video and I managed to lose it. I was like searching for five minutes in the kitchen now. Or for an extra bit of irony, even the protective glass shell on this security camera. Got a long focal length lens, polarizing filters to reduce window reflections and your neighbors just happen to have a Christmas tree set up in the living room, well, now you get a 360 degree live video feed from your neighbor's room from across the street. And you'll probably go to jail. Let's make things a tiny bit more absurd. Now you may actually see how well I brushed my teeth. Or didn't. This was an actual request I received from a dentist living in Dresden, Germany. I made this like a, into a prototype with a screen all running of a 9 volt battery with lights projecting off the sphere to light the inside of the mouth and to capture a photo at the same time. Inspired by this old plan for a planetarium made from a single mirror sphere. But I took it apart already some years ago. But why limit ourselves to reality? There is a whole discipline in art called 
anamorphosis, centered around drawing things distorted to then be undistorted by the viewer in some sense, either by standing in a specific spot or by using a specific object. And oh boy, no one in art history was more obsessed about stuff like this than M. C. Escher. You know, the guy who inspired designs in Inception and Harry Potter with his surreal drawing style. He loved practicing his skills by drawing mirror balls. And guess what we learned about those today? We may now teleport into the room of MC Escher as he lived in those times. Not just pencil drawings, mind you, even woodcuts managed to deliver a proper projection. Honestly, what an artist. But up till now, these have all been well, toy examples for the hell of it. Can we get anything useful going? I'll cut to the chase. Anywhere where a camera cannot survive or cannot be installed in an economical manner is a mwah, prime example for this kind of application. For instance. For instance, let's say you want to analyze how cheese melts inside a microwave. Well, you can just put a camera into the microwave and turn it off. You see where this is going. Placing a mirror sphere inside the microwave is the idea here. I removed the front glass for clarity and we may shoot through the waveguard to get our 360 degree panorama from inside a live running microwave. How cool is that? Getting clean video from the inside of a microwave is a trick I learned from Steve Mould, by the way. Shout out to his excellent science channel. But it gets better. But if you call, call now, now, within the next 20 minutes, because we can't do this all day, we'll give you multi-source video feeds. Remember how no matter where we look from, where we are, mathematically, we get the same projection, which means we can combine multiple video sources into one without parallax. Asterisk. For instance, here I make myself a melted cheese bread abomination and we may inspect this process with a normal color camera and an infrared camera to monitor temperature. But if we combine the two, we get a parallax shift because the cameras are not in the same position. However, if we film the same mirror ball with both the thermal camera and the normal color camera, we capture the same information, just rotated differently. If we match those rotations, we we'll get a 100% parallax-free combination of both signals. A combined signal 360 degree video fade. I even made a VR version for the Oculus Quest where one eye is infrared and the other one is color image, like the Terminator. Horrible, don't do it, instant headache. Of course, these are just fun demos, but in the real world, sometimes these cost-effective and flexible solutions can be a realistic option. Wanna get close to a dangerous process like in a laser cladding machine? Just throwing in a sphere and you are not risking any expensive equipment. And practically, you aren't even interested in 360 degree video in such a monitoring scenario. So just throwing in a 1 8 sphere segment into a corner of your machine? That ain't expensive. Record that and send it to your client with one of these cheap Google Cardboard 3D glasses for a 360 degree VR demo of your machine's interior. Admittedly, quite gimmicky and we are teetering on the edge of making things looking ridiculous. Quite frankly, we are long past that, aren't we? But this ain't just gimmicky what-ifs. Robotics uses sphere halves as something called omnidirectional sensors, a 360 camera for cheapsies, with projections specifically tuned for specific tasks. One for the floor plane, for object avoidance and stuff, and one for the surrounding view based on the cylinder. Finally, there are evolutions of this technique, and curved convex mirrors in general are a video in of itself. For instance, to address the bad resolution towards the pole point, you can use a parabolic mirror instead of a spherical one, allowing one to allocate spatial resolution a bit smarter at the cost of a taller mirror. There is still so much I have cut for time. Like the work of Paul Bork, who invented a thing called the eye dome, a kind of peripheral vision filling projector setup for simulation gaming. And since it uses a spherical mirror, it automatically has the most resolution in the middle of the image. Foveated rendering before it was cool. 
And so much more cool things people do with such a primitive. I mean, it's a ball for crying out loud. It doesn't get simpler than this. So much with such a primitive yet captivating piece of mathematics. Here is a rapid fire pew, 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 round of things to explore around this topic more broadly. There is a Quake mod that allows you to play through the game with different environment projections called Blinky. It's quite amazing how quickly you get used to seeing things that are behind and in front of you at the same time. There is the block of Adrian Kuresh, which breaks down rendering pipelines of video games and GTA 5 specifically uses a spherical dome to feed their sky rendering. Also, GTA 5 uses an interesting approach for the car reflections using a parabolic projection. And there is an interesting paper about getting detailed light reconstruction using just two billiard balls. Man, I could go on and on and on. So many people doing so much cool stuff with all kinds of environmental projection shenanigans. Speaking of people doing cool things, here is where you come in. I want to build a huge user-submitted library of mirror balls from around the globe. Wherever you live, wherever you are right now, keep an eye out for anything mirror ballsy or mirror curvy. If you find such a thing, take a picture of it and import it into the web app. Crop and rotate to see how the projection looks. If it looks interesting, submit that photo as a pull request on GitHub. That way GitHub will credit you as a web app collaborator. If you can't be bothered with any of that, just shoot me an email with the photo attached and I'll credit you in the photo's description. We covered so much, yet so little. Kinda like Skyrim, this topic is wide as the ocean, but this video is deep as a puddle. Even so. I hope this was a good overview of the mirrorball projection and how different fields make use of it and a great appetizer if you want to dive deeper yourself. Now get me those photos of Spider-Man. I don't want excuses! I want pictures!